everyone, I'm Brianna and you're in the lab and guess what? Do 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 Inspector Excel do 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 ooh, ooh. Bill Jell and Mr. Excel is here to show you how to find fraud using Excel today on the lab. <laughs> Welcome to the lab. I'm Leo Laporte, and we're so glad you're here today. We're going to have a great time. Obviously, uh, Brianna's a little hmm, but uh, what was that song? Uh, Inspector Excel. Inspector Excel. There's an actual song called Inspector Excel. Well, I made it up. Not exactly good at singing, but I gave it my best shot. How do you like that, Bill? That's, awesome. That's your new theme song. Oh, I like that. Bill yes. Jell and Mr. Excel is here. That's going to be a lot of fun. We've got a great show. Give me that clipboard. I want to see what we have. It's all yours. Brianna McIver, ladies and gentlemen. Yep. Uh, well, you're going to show off the Wii. I am. Are yep. you a Wii player? Uh, well, of all the gaming consoles, it's pretty girl friendly. It's nice. It matches your size. It's Wii. Yes, exactly. Uh, and and uh, you're actually going to show a really cool use of the Wii. Yeah. Turning it into a media center. Yeah. A lot of people use like their Xbox and stuff, but this one is. The Wii is found in like a lot of family homes, so much yeah. a good way to show off your photos. And Why, not? Yeah. Why not? Why um, not? So that's coming up. Chris Krug is here. He's fantastic. Chris is going to talk about citizen journalism. Mm -hmm. You know, and in events like uh, the Katrina uh, hurricane or the recent um, uh, independence movement or rebels or whatever happened in Kosovo, I, we don't know because mainstream media did a lousy job covering it, but the but people were there on the ground and the citizen journalism has just taken off. So mm -hmm. we're going to talk a little bit about that. Let's get a, a call on the air, though, because sure. that's what this show is all about. Yeah, this is Steve, and he's from Bowmanville, Ontario. Thank you, Brianna. Yeah, no problem. Hello, Steve. Hey, Leo. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Oh, I'm just great. Welcome to the lab. What can I do for you today? See, now we're all singing because of Brianna. She got us all singing. The lab. What can I do for you today? Well, Leo, um, I was wondering if it's possible to put a file on a thumb drive and not allow anyone to remove or copy it, uh, only view it. Uh, so you basically want to use copy protection. Well, um... What I have is a client who does math tutorial books, and we were looking to go green instead of printing the books. Great idea. Um, because it's geared to high school kids, and, mm -hmm. you know, thumb drives, uh, I thought would be the kind of thing that they it's might. It's a great use. idea, and then they can reuse the thumb drive. That's correct, yeah. Um, but I thought maybe if there's a way to <clears throat> portion the drive and lock it out or... Well, I, I, I would just, it's cop, what you're talking about is copy protection. I'd just like to point out how well it's done for the music and movie industry. Uh, it's been a great success, hasn't it? Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what's going on. It's uh, Yes, you can. There are a number of ways you could do this. You're probably already putting those books in PDF format, I would guess, or some sort of ebook that's, format. That, yes, that's correct. Yeah, ebooks, uh, of course, are copy protectable. Adobe Acrobat has a protection scheme. They have their own ebook scheme. Uh, you pay some money for that, uh, but it, it is copy protected. I should point out it's also been cracked, as has every copy protection scheme under the sun. So, what happens with copy protection is people who are motivated to steal. Steal because they know how to, they just go online and they Google how to here it is tool to remove copy protection of PDF files. It took me two seconds. So anybody who wants to steal it will steal it. And then so so really the only use for copy protection and then this is the argument the music industry uh, gives is it prevents uh, casual copying. So you give it to a student, the student's not going to give it to his friend because it's you know he can't figure it out. It's like oh it's protected. Oh well never mind. Uh, and it, and, it, and it probably would do that. But there is also a price because it's inconvenient. All of a sudden, a teacher can't move it to another, uh, uh, can't move it to the hard drive, for instance, or can't run it in places. You have to change your uh, workflow because now you've got to add copy protection. You've got to monitor the copy protection. You've got to make sure you, you know, you uh, keep it up to date. Sometimes these copy protection schemes, most of them phone home at some point, so you've got to run a server to to validate that this is a legitimate copy. It gets more and more complicated. So. Yeah, you can. And my recommendation would be to use the Adobe eBook format, uh, which isn't terribly expensive. You have to have buy the full Adobe Acrobat, I believe, to do that, which yeah, is I few. Full, I have the full version of Acrobat yeah. myself. So well, it has encryption uh, built into it. And, and that's all we want to do is really, I think, not. I, I understand that you know people probably can hack it at some point, but we want to make it a little less, you know, not as easy to do, you know. Yeah, that's exactly what the record industry and the movie industry say. And, I, you know, interestingly enough, at least the record industry is moving away from this, realizing that uh, it, it, be, it does inconvenience uh, legitimate customers and it doesn't deter piracy. 
Uh, in fact, most recently, a record company, um, as an experiment, put out some unprotected uh, music and then checked the uh, the uh, the torrent sites to see if any of that unprotected music was on the sites. And in fact, it had not been copied. It had not been pirated. Um, you know, we got, we got the idea. I, at least I got the idea from the bare naked lake ladies. They, they gave it away. Yeah, they they gave it away and. I mean, and it and it works for them. Uh, they don't protect it. Now I understand what you're saying, and it's really a different issue when you have a what's it called a vertical market, where you have a uh, you know a limited potential audience, and you really can't afford to have it copied too much because you're only going to sell so many copies anyway. That's right. So that's so I understand the desire at that point. You know, I, I use as an example uh, Mr. Excel who's sitting right there. He doesn't have a microphone on, but uh, he gives away his book. Um, he gives away copies of his book, Learn Excel from Mr. Excel. He's given away millions of chapters. He's now giving away the whole book online. And it doesn't, it hasn't, you can't talk, but it hasn't hurt your sales, has it? Sales have tripled. Sales have tripled. So I, I just want to put this political perspective in here for you on copy protection. However, the answer, the quick and easy answer is you've already got the tools to do it. Adobe has an ebook format that is copy protected. It has been cracked. Um, as, despite Adobe's best efforts to keep it from being cracked, um, uh, you know, there you go. Yes, they, they, you can do it, and uh, and that's probably the easiest way to do it. Um, they they call it their digital editions, and um, it does require. Well, actually, this is another thing. This is actually kind of an interesting idea, which you might want to look at as the digital editions. But this is, these are all Adobe products. They're the guys who've really figured this out for print media. Right. Now, well, that's that's what the direction we're in. I just, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it's a good, you know, I like the idea of not printing them on paper. Well, you know, I, I think it's, you know, like, I think some people will still want to have it that one. Mm -hmm. um, but this is an option where they can take it, put it on their laptop, and do the exercise. I, I like the idea of putting it on the Internet and letting them download it. <laughs> like, that's what Mr. Excel's doing. He's giving it away on the Internet. And then people are incented to pay for the paper version because they want a paper version. They want the reference materials. You have to decide. It's your business, Steve. I'm not going to tell you uh, how to run your business. You know what your market is interested in. You know what the issues are. You know what the risks are uh, of, of giving it away unprotected. But I do, I do want to kind of start opening people's eye, uh, minds to the thought that sometimes giving it away is the best way to uh, make money, believe it or not. Weird right. as that might sound, counterintuitive as that might sound. And Mr. Except, we'll talk to him in a little bit on the show, and we'll get his uh, story, but he's, he's really a good example of that. Hey, thanks, Steve. Okay. Have a great day. Thanks. Take care. Coming up, Chris Krug. Well, actually, the, Brianna's going to show us Wee Media Center a little bit, but first, Chris Krug, he's talking about, look at Brianna with her Wee. Chris Krug's going to talk about citizen journalists. The lab continues in just a bit. Stay right here. Welcome back to the lab. Leo Laporte here. Chris Krug is here. He's the president of Rain City Studios. We love Rain City. You see a lot of them on the show because they're doing so many interesting things from web design to helping uh, citizens create their own uh, sites so that they can change the world. And that's sure. really what you're about, I know, is, is making a big difference in the world. Let's talk about citizen journalism because that is a hot topic right now. Definitely. Everybody has cell phones. Everybody's got blogs. Yeah. Uh, the mainstream media is starting to see, feel like sometimes it's a little bit stayed, stiff and old well, compared you've seen to what's all the mainstream media sources adapt new segments to their show, which is kind of the citizen journalism segments where right. if you think back CNN during Hurricane Katrina, a lot of the first stories that were coming out, first photos, the first videos were coming from people stuck on top of roofs with camera phones yeah. uploaded into the internet. So they couldn't get uh, journalists real, sure. so-called real journalists in, so they had to rely on people on the ground. Is that what citizen journalism is? Yeah, citizen journalism is really just, you know, the idea that with recording devices like right. our iPhones and our little Samsungs here that shoot video, we can right. be out on the streets taking pictures of things that matter to us. You know, if there's right. a, a car accident on your street or someone something a new store on your street, you take a photo, upload it to the net, and you have this hyper local version of news taking place. Right. And lots of right. different creators. Now you have things like Quick, which allow people to stream from their camera phones. Right. You can even watch live and interact live with a story as it breaks. Definitely. A, a couple of years ago, I was at the uh, Olympics in Torino, the 2006 Olympics, and we were live blogging via um, camera phones. Uh, those Isn't jazz cool? jars with uh, ComView software on them, and we wow. were blogging, video blogging live over the internet from the Olympics. There has seemed to be a little impedance mismatch, though, between mainstream media and citizen journalism. You're right. You know, People like CNN trying to incorporate it in, but it never quite seems to 
to fit. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an emerging uh, it's an emerging field. And so I don't think it's the fault of citizen journalism. I think it's more the fault of the old media. No, they're trying to figure out what to do. They with don't it. get it. Yeah, yeah. And and really, the best way to participate in citizen journalism is probably not on TV because that's still a one way medium. Right. But in an interactive medium like the internet. Yeah, there's some great sites. One's nowpublic.com. Mm -hmm. This is a site that aggregates all sorts of um, citizen journalism from across the web. Is that a bright site? Is that one of uh, yours? It's a Drupal site, but it's it not a bright site. Okay, yeah, so it's a Drupal yeah, site. Yeah, yeah. Um, essentially, you can see the story there. Say like the hurricane, Hurricane Katrina, mm -hmm. and then other people can add media that they've created to it. So they can add photos, oh. they can add audio clips that they've created, they can add video files, and then people can source content there like you would in the Associated Press if you're a real journalist. Right. Think of like a news girl, a big pool of photos or videos right. that you can use to blog about the story or write oh, about the story in your own place. See, that's a good idea, because right now the way citizen journalism works is it's, all, it's spread out all over the net and you have to know who to follow, or there has to be some sort of ad hoc gathering, like perhaps for Torino you had a central site for that one event, right? Yeah, you're familiar with some of the technologies that help make uh, citizen journalism meaningful, like tagging. So, you know, by tagging, tagging things, um, you know, Kosovo independence on Flickr, right. uh, you can go ahead and take a look at everybody's photos all at one, all that's at one page. That's been really good, right? yeah. yeah. So that's the way you kind of pull together those loose pieces that right. are spread out all over the internet. But that requires the user to know yes. what to look for and how to do that. And I think sure. that that is a very small slice of Yeah, I of, think of you're right. And, and that also uh, creates opportunities for sites like Now Public, yeah. where it's it's crowdsourced news media. Yeah. Well, let's take a look at some of the events that have been... You mentioned the Kosovo independence. Uh, yeah, we've well, talked I, about Katrina. Um, I have a couple things up here. On Flickr, I have... Um, this is the cluster of photos tagged Katrina on Flickr. So you'll see here just a there's, whole there's bunch There's thousands of, of them now. Yeah, yeah there's uh, 1,200 on this particular wow. tag. But you'll just see So here. just to, to fill people in, you would go to Flickr.com, which is a Yahoo site, uh, yep. and then you would search for a keyword, kind yeah, of? Yeah, so right here at the top of the search box, I have the search everyone's photos, and we can type in uh, Hurricane Katrina. That's an amazing picture of that, of that fella. Yeah. That's yeah. There's some really talented photographers. I know you're one of them so on, you go. I mean, on here's, Flickr. Here's the actual photos of the Hurricane wow. Katrina coming firsthand from Look at that folks. picture. Wow. Yeah, just use the search box. And then you can dial it down. You know, if you look at this picture, which we use through search, it's also tagged uh, Katrina, Hurricane, and Hurricane spelled incorrectly a few different ways. <laughs> so you can well, they did, that, they did that on purpose so that people who misspell Hurricane will find it? That's right. I think so. Isn't probably, that funny? Yeah. I mean, what a gorgeous, what an amazing picture. Now, some of these pictures are licensed so that you could use it in your blog, and some of them aren't. How can I tell that? Uh, in this particular case, uh, at, down here at the bottom under additional information, this one says all rights reserved. But here's so the you I, couldn't reuse that one. Uh, not you're right. You could not reuse yeah. it so without permission. Right. You'd have to ask. You have to ask. Permission. The ideal is to like if you want to be a citizen journalist, uh, the ideal would be to license things under Creative Commons. And that's it, available on Flickr. It's a very simple couple of clicks. That's right. And what does that mean if I say it's Creative Commons? It, it's, it's a license that says that it stipulates how people can use your images. The way that I put mine out there is I say you can use it for anything you want that's not commercial as long as you attribute me. Right. And therefore people can use my photos, they don't have to ask, I get a credit. Um, get it out there, get your stuff out there. I think it's a great idea. You know, a, clearly a, a photo of this quality, somebody's hoping to sell that sure. to a major news agency. But very often these, almost always on Flickr in fact, this stuff is, is freely usable. If you check the license you can see. Yep. Is there stuff on, I mean is there video too, is there like YouTube? Yeah, and definitely. I pulled up, um, I was in Torino like I said, with the um, with the Canadian Olympic How team, exciting. so I got some video here of me interviewing all the Canadian snowboarders in the BC Canada house. Now, immediately, first thing you see is, look, this isn't a CNN cameraman. This is a guy probably working with his with his camera phone. This is me with my cell phone, sitting in a room full of athletes. But there's an immediacy and an authenticity that you you don't get. Oh, yeah. The big camera crew and a producer and a talent standing there with right. a big microphone in their face. These guys are really talking for real. And, and, and they don't feel intimidated by you or your presence there. In fact, you're one of them. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. The other thing I think that's really important about it is in the mainstream media, video, yeah. you get you get one story. You get the kind of uh, right. vanilla story that's going to appeal to everybody. Right. But what right. citizen There's journalism... There's a mentality. Yeah. Everybody covers the same thing. Citizen yeah. journalism allows you to find those stories that maybe don't appeal to quite as wide of an audience. Right. You know, Canadian snowboard team might right. not make the CBC main news, but it's, it's definitely a story worth covering. So if viewers want to get beyond the obvious, the top line story that everybody is, is covering, they do have to have some skills. They have to go know about sites. This is YouTube. Can you search for tags on YouTube? Definitely. Everything's tagged on uh, on YouTube. So, so if I search for Canadian snowboard, I'd probably find this. Yeah, if you searched uh, Canadian snowboard Olympics, you would probably okay. find this. You know, there's a lot of stuff out there, so you have to refine it a bit. Now Public's a great site for citizen journalism. 
Uh, Flickr's a great site. YouTube's a great site. I can also think of events, uh, most recently, the, the Kosovo independence movement, mm -hmm. where the mainstream media actually couldn't get in there. Uh, Katrina, also another example. So that there were, there were people on the ground who are actually participants. These conflict zones are a place where this stuff really goes beyond just being cool and starts being really important. Important, um, you're right. News gets out firsthand. I'm having trouble remembering, I think it was East Timor or something recently where uh, journalism was shut down completely. Oh no, it was the Burmese monks. The Burmese right. monks. The monks. Yeah. And the monks. 100% of the news that came out from that was from citizen journalists. Yeah. People uploaded they stuff had, to the internet. They had camera phones. They had cell phones. Right. It was kind of an amazing thing. And right. otherwise we would not have known what was going on in Burma. We only would have known what the Burmese government wanted us yeah. to know. It's very powerful. In a way, it's it's a democratizing influence because it means nobody can keep a lid on stuff anymore. Information does want to be Definitely free. Fewer gatekeepers, yeah. tools in the hands of people. It's really exciting. Good stuff. Chris Krug is the uh, president of Rain City Studios, which is a, a, a web design firm. But it's more than a web design firm. It's a firm that helps people get their visions, their ideas uh, out onto the Internet. And that's what's so powerful about uh, the Internet is it brings... Uh, uh, people who want to know together with people who know, and it's amazing, amazing medium for this. So much, so much better, really, than uh, anything we've had up to now. Thank you for being in here, Chris. Thanks, Bob. RainCityStudios.com for more information, and we'll put links uh, to all the kind of keywords and places you might want to look, including was it is openpublic.org.com? What is it? Now public. Now public dot com. Dot com. Yes. That's a great site. We'll put that in the Lab with Leo website uh, so that you can find these links and do your own. Uh, what is the what is the consumer of citizen journalism? Citizen audience, you think? I guess it's Why just not? journalism. <laughs> really. Journalism. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. All right, coming up in just a little bit, Brianna's a, a wee little person with a wee little game. Wee! But first, Mr. Excel, he's just around the corner. More of your calls, too, as the lab continues. Now, let's take a close-up look at something you might find around the lab. It looks like the toe of a sneaker. I don't know what that is. I'll tell you what. We'll zoom out and find out when the lab continues. Well, there it is. A close-up of something you might find around the lab. What the tech is it? Let's zoom out and find out. Oh, it's a wee nunchuck. Now, is that how you spell nunchuck with lowercase n? Is that like the special fancy way the kids do it today? It's the nunchuck? Probably. Ladies and gentlemen. Brianna McIver, who later on is going to show us how to make a Wii into a media center. But first, another call. Yeah, this is Sophie, and she's from Drummondville, Quebec. Thank you, Brianna. Hello, Sophie. Hello, Leo. Thank oh. you for accepting my call. Oh, but of course. I. How could I not? <laughs> what could I do for you? Um, I'm thinking about installing uh, Ubuntu on an old computer. Uh, my computer is really, really slow. It's got Windows XP right now on it. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that I can make it be a little faster and work more efficiently. I think that's a brilliant idea. Um, a lot of old computers that really are too low and slow to run current versions of Windows are perfectly fast enough to run Linux. And the beauty is Linux is free, so you're not spending a lot of money to keep that computer going. Uh, it's a really good use of an old computer because Linux, the free open source operating system, is very secure. There are no viruses or spyware issues. Uh, it's reliable, and it can do pretty much anything a Windows PC can do. It's a, it's a, I think it's a very good choice. Now, Ubuntu, which is a, a great Linux distribution, ubuntu.com, is, uh, is a pretty modern one and is generally designed for the latest hardware. So if you, you know, you can, the beauty of this is you can get a CD from them uh, or download it. Either way, the CDs are free. They have a free uh, program to mail you a CD. Um, or you can, as I said, download it. What you could do is use this CD as what they call a live CD. That is, put it in, if your computer is modern enough to have a CD player that it can boot from built in, and you can put it into the CD player, boot it up, run Ubuntu, and see how it works on your machine. See if your machine's fast enough, see if all the hardware is supported. If it's not, there's another version of Ubuntu called Shubuntu. It's right, it's right down here. Let me go to it. X-U-B-U-N-T-U dot org for this one and this is specifically designed for slower machines uh, it has a less heavy-duty GUI Linux without the graphical operating system is is plenty fast is you know fast enough on even the even a really like a Pentium uh, I mean because the, the, text doesn't require a lot of horsepower it's the, the GUI the menus the windows all that stuff that really starts to eat up CPU cycles and Shubuntu is designed with a much lighter weight graphical interface. So if you can't run Ubuntu, then I would download 
X Ubuntu or Shubuntu, I don't know how you pronounce that. And, um, and that will usually run on almost anything. You can even get lower and slower if, if even that is, what, what processor is in your machine, do you know? Um, it's 1.7, uh, gigahertz? Gigahertz, oh. it's at Pentium 4. Yeah, you should be fine with Ubuntu. I don't think that's going to be any problem. That's pretty fast. How much memory is in that? Um, 756. Yeah, I think Ubuntu will probably run well. Uh, X Ubuntu might be another choice. You're right on the on the border there, especially because of the amount of memory is is a little bit low. And, and but but uh, and and, in, and if worst case, uh, you can always uh, go to DistroWatch. D i s t o d i s t r o w a t c h dot com. This is a place where they list all the Linux distributions. Linux was written by a Finnish graduate student, Linus Torvalds, in 1991, and uh, he gave it away. He said, I'm not going to copyright it. I'm going to let anybody make copies of it. So there are a lot of different versions of Linux. They call them distributions. And the big difference, they all have Linux, but the big difference in them is the programs that come with them, uh, how much power they require, what they're compiled for, and all of that. So this is a great place to go, distrowatch.com, to see what the most popular distributions are, but you can even search for distributions that are designed for slower machines. You can, you know, and, and real geeks will often build a version of Linux designed for the machine that they're going to use it on. You don't need to do that, though. So start with Ubuntu, run the live CD, see if it'll boot up, see if it runs, you know, speedily enough for you. If not, X Ubuntu might be a good choice. Uh, gives you all of the capabilities. It just doesn't require so much horsepower. Okay? Wonderful. Yes, and the programs, um, I can, do I have to use Linux programs? Ah, yes. Yeah, that's an okay. important point. You can't just, okay. you know, install Microsoft Office and it'll work. Uh, you, you generally, in almost every regard, there are analogous Linux programs for the Windows programs you're used to using. For instance, instead of Microsoft Office, you'd use OpenOffice, which is free. And uh, does everything Microsoft Office will do completely compatibly. It'll write a Microsoft Office document that can be read by all your friends who are using Windows. And in, in almost every respect, there is a Linux version of the of the Windows program. If you really have to run a Windows program, there's something called the Wine Project, and that is uh, essentially a Windows emulator. Although Wine stands for Wine is not a Windows emulator, it is. Uh, and the Wine Project will allow you to, in fact, even run Microsoft Office, but it takes a little messing around with it. That's at winehq.org, although, again, that comes on most Linux distributions. So the, 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 there is a qualified yes. You can run some Windows software on there. I would go to WineHQ, and they have a database of what programs will run on there. So if you absolutely have to run a Windows program, uh, yeah, you can do it under Wine in many cases. Great. There's, Thank you very there's an applications much. database right here that says all the different programs. Look, you can even run Half-Life 2. I mean, it's, a, it's kind of amazing the variety you can run. You can run Excel. You can run Word. Thank you so much for the call. It's great to talk to you, Sophie. Thank you. Take care. I really yeah. love it that people are starting to say, hmm, what else is there out there besides Windows and OS X? Is there another way to go? And Linux is a great operating system. Mature, powerful, reliable, secure, uh, and free. I think people should absolutely take a look at it. All right, we're going to uh, take a break. Coming back. Oh, should I do a shiny? He's got lunch boxes. I hate to, I hate to keep Sean waiting. Let's wander over and see a Sean shiny. Yeah, I had to bring my lunchbox out because I'm looking at your shirt. All this food on here is Yeah, the, I have a barbecue on my shirt. <laughs> uh, I hope it's lunch. So, <laughs> so well, we, we've got Star Wars lunchboxes. Yes, but they're not just any Star Wars lunchboxes. When you open them up, What's in fact, side? they are a little tin kit for your Nintendo DS. Oh, so it's not lunch, it's a game machine in there. Oh, that yeah, is cute. So you can, and it's got foam, so it's protected. Yeah, it's got your foam uh, protection, as you say. It's got a little charger. Styluses, it's got game it, slots. Yeah, it actually uh, has little rubber protectors for your uh, games oh, as that's well. that's funny. It, it comes with the extra styluses, it comes with these headphones, it comes with this. That's the car charge. So this charger. is for people who are expecting to get in an earthquake with their DS or a tornado. Pretty much. Or, I mean, this is pretty hardcore or, protection. Or if you want to cart it around all over the place and you don't want it all just rattling and you around want the because you've got your Star Wars lunchbox. Yeah, there you go. Oh, that's so fun. Do they have a Brady Bunch lunchbox with a DS? They have a whole pile of different they licensed do. Uh, titles. Oh, I don't know if they have a Brady Bunch, but oh, that's Star Wars. Hysterical. I mean, we fear we use this for the geeks. <laughs> well, you know, I have a Nintendo DS Lite. I love it. I think this might be a really good case. How much are they? 
$30. All right, let's look at the pros and cons on Sean's Shinies. The Shinies are? Well, it is. it does provide you with a lot of storage and a lot of accessories. And, you know, it's going to be collectible down the road. I look think so. It. Don't even take it out of the case. Yeah, yeah. even if even if you take all Still of the, the Wii stuff or the, uh, the DDS <laughs> stuff out of it, it's still worth <laughs> some money. What's, what are the negatives? Yeah, you know, only 30 bucks. The, the accessories are a bit on the cheap oh, side. So it comes with the uh, headphones. It, it all comes that. with all oh, that neat. stuff. So, but okay. don't expect them to be super fantastic. Yeah, and it's mostly foam. Yeah, there's, that's there's not so bad. Yeah. I mean, and the fact that it's foam, it keeps it protected. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you, Sean. All right, we've got a lot of great stuff still to come, including Mr. Excel. Bill Jelen is here. He's going to show you Excel security, how to detect fraud in Excel. But right now, it's time for our quick quiz question of the day, talking about Linux. What does Apache do? It comes with Linux. In fact, it's probably the most used Linux program of all. Is it an email server, a web page server, a firewall, or an online gaming host? You tell me. We'll talk about it a little later on as the lab continues. Welcome back to the lab. Mr. Excel is here, Bill Jellen. We always welcome Mr. Excel hey, with open arms. He's so great. Bill is the, the author of so many great Excel books, including Learn Excel for Mr. Excel. We were talking earlier on about how they, you actually give this away online. That's right. So far, um, 40,000 people have downloaded that book. That's great. Um, which but is, it's tripled sales of the book. It has. And I think yeah. that's really key. I mean, it's important for people to understand that, uh, you know, if you make stuff digitally available, it's going to get out. There's almost no point in copy protecting because people will, will just right. take it. That's so right. give it away. And the truth is, especially in a case like this where you can download it and everything, but you still really kind of want to have the book, you know, the it other, sells the book. The other thing I did here, and it'll be interesting to see how it works, it's kind of like the public radio concept. I said, hey, if you just like the book and right. just want to keep the book and you want to send me five bucks, Send me five and do people do that? Some people do. That's really interesting. And then I send them a higher resolution version of the book. Ah. Right. So even if they don't want to buy the book, some people say, yeah, you know, it's worth it. And what I do is I say the cost of lunch in your country. Right. You know, so in India, you might get a dollar or two, right. but that's right. cool. What, you know, whatever. That's a, you know, that's a significant thing. Yeah. I think that's a great, I think it's a wonderful idea. I mean, we do the same thing at Twit. We say a cup of coffee. You know, okay. a cup of coffee a month. Yeah. That's all right. we ask. Right. Of course, with the price of coffee these days, that's going to be a lot of money. <laughs> this is his newest, Excel for Auditors. Now, this is a little more serious. Oh, this is wild. I've started doing some seminars for auditors. Boy, they are seriously into the data. They use spreadsheets. So, uh, and, and their clients, I should say, use spreadsheets. So auditors need to validate these spreadsheets and that they're accurate, right? Well, even beyond that, just trying to find irregularities, trying to find fraud within the company. Oh, interesting. Um, like, it, you know, a huge company, you can't go audit every record. Right. So you have to quickly hone in on the ones that you want to so audit. So these are kind of automated ways of auditing. Well, sort of, yeah. yeah. Just figure out where to start so okay. that they can go do their manual audits. So let's, these, let's take a look. Yeah, now, is this Excel 2007 you're going to show it's us? I'm using Excel 2003. These tricks work in both. Okay. Although certainly the auditors need more than 65,000 rows. So. <laughs> Sometimes they do. This book covers uh, 97 through 2007. It does so both. Yeah, you're, so you're set for every right, version of Excel right. that you might be dealing with. All right, so the first one, I thought this was great. I have here a list of employees. Okay. And I have their employee ID and their address. Okay. And then a list of vendors and the vendor address. Okay. Okay, and they said you can't compare these two because it will never work. But we want So what you're trying to find out is if an employee is, is billing the company as a, as a vendor. Yeah. That that's something you really want to know. Right. But what they said was you want to look for the first seven digits of the address. So that gets the number and the first couple letters of the street name. And that's enough to at least get some, you know, close. Right. And You're not well, going to have a lot of false matches there. So actually, I have had already set up here. I used the left function, the left function. Okay. So the left that of just the address takes for the, seven. For seven. And then I did a match. And anytime we have a number in the match, that means that they're similar. And we want to go look. So 1184 okay. Cedar Highway. Notice highway is abbreviated. Okay. But it matched 1184 Cedar Highway spelled out. Right. So there we have a vendor and an employee living at the same address. How, what does the match function do? The match function says, hey, go take a look at this value. Yeah. The first four digits of okay. the, the number in the first couple and letters. see of the how name, closely it matches. And see if you can find it in this list. So it's looking for an exact match within the left seven characters of the vendor. Okay. So it's kind of like a lookup function. It, what it does, does is it tells me which row number it's on. And then you could sort the match by match. Sure. Let's do that. So there, we have two two possible employees. And who, in fact, you can eyeball it, and boy, you can see. 817 Sycamore. There it is, 1817. I think we got a match. Yeah. 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 So, you know, interesting, interesting there. Okay, here's another one. 5,000 vendors in the company. Who do you start to audit? Right. Okay, so they ran two reports. This year's invoice count and invoice amount. Okay. And last year's invoice count and invoice amount. Okay. All right. And then what we do is we subtract. We say, okay, how much did the invoice count change? 
How much did the invoice amount change? You don't expect to see a big difference? Is well, that the idea? Well, here's what we do. We put it on a chart as a scatter chart. Okay. Okay. This is a chart I hardly ever use. It's so, a statistical chart, really. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we do an XY chart and let me put it on a new sheet here. I have to say, auditors helped you with this book. Yes, so, right. th so this is the tools they use. These are their clever tricks and yeah. techniques that they've come up with over time. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So the scatter chart. Uh, and, and so here's what it does. All of these dots. Every dot is a vendor. And what we let's, let's take a look at it. Okay, there we go. What we expect to see is this whole group Plumped here together. Yeah. People that didn't change. It's the outliers that are. It's the, the outliers. Yeah. So anyone who's way out here. Or here we have people who sent us 500 less invoices, but a million dollars more. That's a real right. red flag. So red out of flag. these 5,000 vendors, we want to go look for those 20. This is the kind of thing the IRS does. It's wild. Yeah, and yeah. these tools are so powerful because they automate all this stuff. You right. can really find right. stuff you could never find. It's like a needle in a haystack. Okay, now what's my favorite Excel feature? The pivot table. <laughs> I was afraid you'd say that. <laughs> here I have, what do I have? I have 3,000 rows of data, invoice, and then I matched it up with when we had the receipt. Okay. So we invoiced them this date. Here's the receipt. Okay. We can do all kinds of analysis with a pivot table. Okay. All right. So let me just choose data and then pivot table. We'll click finish. Um, one analysis we can do is we can start to take a look at how quickly people are paying us. Right. Um, and so I have, let's see, I put it days to pay out here. And usually when I put that on the pivot table, it shows me every single day. Right. right. But there's a really deep feature. I'm going to right click and choose group and show detail and group it up into 30 days. So I'll say I want to see everything from 30 to 150 days payment in groups of 30. You know, that's okay. the typical. People are paying us in 30, 60, 90. Oh, that's perfect. Right. So you only get a few entries there. Yeah, so I put that across the top. Now I put okay. customers down the side. And all of a sudden we'll be able to see. Who's taking a long time. Right. So most of these people are paying us 30 within days. 60 days. But 60 look, days. You know, these people. Oh, boy. Oh, yeah, there's some problems out there. Yeah. Um, so we might want to go take. So this isn't, this isn't looking for uh, fraud. This is looking for <laughs> slow pays. Okay. But here's the next one. I'm going to take customer off. Okay. And I'm going to put the rep. This is the person who gets the check. Okay. All right. So the check goes to accounts receivable. Yeah. And they log it in. And we're going to take a look at the rep. And we don't care about days to pay anymore, but I want to see what day of the week it came in. All right. Now, if you think about it, you know, in Ohio, we don't get mail on Tuesday. Right. Because someone, you know, locally who mailed on Friday is going to show up on Monday. Right. So Tuesday is a slow day. I would expect. It's unlikely to get mail on Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. I would expect Tuesday to be a slow day. But we took a look at this company. I mean, um, this is so clever. Let me change to. Do you remember the name of the guy who came up with this one? I mean, this is really. This, this is um, auditsoftware.net. Very interesting uh, yeah. stuff. Uh, Rich Lanza out there. Rich Lanza. Okay. Well done. So. Again, let me. Let you me have to be a little detective. You have, <laughs> yeah. and you really have to have a mind for this. Let stuff. me change it to percentages so we can see it uh, okay. as a percentage of the row. Click OK. All right. So here's what we see: a lot of checks coming in on Monday. Yeah, you'd expect that. And yeah. Tuesday's a slow day. Yeah. Wednesday. All right. Thursday. Yeah. For some reason, Friday's real light. Okay. Okay. And you would have to take a look at your customers. Are they somewhere that they couldn't get mail to you on Friday? Mm, maybe. And when we went in to look at this, three of the reps, Dan, Martha, and Shelley, days. had big days. But two of them, Bob Nothing. and Sonia. So there's something going orders. on there. So we went and looked. Bob and Sonia are taking off Friday afternoon, <laughs> and the, the checks are sitting in the drawer. They're getting and, they're getting cash Monday. And look here, yeah, Bob and Sonia have huge days on Monday. Uh, well, that'll explain and it. So we have thousands of dollars. They're leaving early, sitting in their desk drawer <laughs> on Friday afternoon. Wow, I love this stuff. It's all in the book Excel oh. for Auditors. Bill Jellin and Wayne K. Dowell. Uh, is this available on your site, MrExcel.com? Sure. And Amazon and every everywhere, everywhere right? else everywhere. too. This yeah. is the kind of thing if you're in this business, or actually if not, if you're somebody like me, a small businessman, these are things I would like to know so I could check on Dane because he's trouble, I'll tell you. <laughs> Excel for Auditors. Mr. Excel, you're the greatest. He answers tens of thousands of Excel questions every year on his website, free, MrExcel.com, and gives away copies of his book. He's just, he's just a natural resource for Excel users. We thank you for coming in. Thanks, we really appreciate it. Are you ready to put movies, video, pictures, and music on your Wii? Yes, you can. Buena will show us in just a little bit. <laughs> but coming up in just a little bit, Ryan Yule and more of your calls. Do you stay right here. Welcome back to the lab. Let's get another caller on the air, and I think Brianna has somebody for me. I sure do. His name is Taylor. He's from Oshawa, Ontario. Oshawa, Ontario. Yeah, he's real excited. He's got a Hurley hat on, too. Hello, Taylor. Hey, how's it going, Leo? It's going great. How are you today? Awesome. Um, I had a question about using one monitor with two computers. Okie dokie. Um, 
I know that there's probably Y connectors out there or something. Yeah, you really don't want to do a Y connector. Um, what you want is a switch, and there, there's a there's a name for these. So you have one compu uh, you have uh, you have two computers, but you don't want to have a bunch of you know two two monitors, two keyboards, two mice. Yeah, I like my desk. Yeah. So what you need is a what's called a KVM switch or keyboard video monitor video mouse switch. And a KVM, we actually use KVM switches all the time here. In fact, when you see, when you see me saying I can't see what's going on, uh, and uh, and uh, and Sean will crawl under the desk. What he's doing is he's punching a button on a KVM switch. Uh, this is an Avocent. Actually, we haven't been that happy with these, as I remember. They're they're kind of funny. One of the problems with them is they're USB focused. Yep. Um, and that's been a little tricky. I, my favorite is IO Gear. I would say that's the company I, I use, and that's the one I would probably recommend. Um, I O G E A R dot uh, they make uh, what you want is a two port. This is a four port, as you can see. Whoa, oh. it was a four port. So, uh, so <laughs> clonk. So the way this works is we can plug in, as you see here, uh, these are the outputs from the computer. So one, two, three, four computers can be hooked up along with their mic and their uh, and their speakers. And we have the USB ports here. And then this is the output. So this goes to my monitor. And, uh, and, and then on the front, we have the USB port for the keyboard and for the mouse. And so what happens is I have a keyboard, mouse, and monitor, just one, hooked up to this. And then I can switch. This is PC1, that's PC2, that's PC3, that's PC4. And whichever one I want to see, that's what I'll see on the screen. It really works, it really works very well. And uh, a lot of people use these. Uh, not very expensive if you're just going to get a two port KVM, which is probably what you're going to want. Yeah. Um, uh, IO Gear is a good one. Belkin makes them. Uh, they're, they're not too bad. I've used Belkins before. Um, it, with digital monitors, it's a little bit trickier. You notice these are VGA monitors, analog monitors. It, you need to get a digital or a DVI KVM, if that's not enough letters for EIEIO. Um, <laughs> And that's a little bit more expensive. You really want one that includes the cables, because the cables can add up. The IO gear that I use is a four-port IO gear that does come with all the DVI cables. And it does a fantastic job. I use it all the time. What about quality? I, get, I do a lot of gaming. So yeah. am I going to see a... I think in theory you could see some latency, uh, but if you're using DVI, it should be instantaneous and, and there isn't any latency once you've switched over. It's, it's just like having a little bit longer cable. So if you keep your cables from getting too long, uh, that's, that's, it's just a longer cable in effect. Uh, I use it and I don't notice any latency at all. Well, that's good. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. I have one more question. Yes, sir. You gonna start doing call for helpathons? <laughs> that was a fun thing. I've only done one. I think Chris Perillo did two of them. That was back when we were uh, doing call for help in the states. We would do a re it was, we did it on Boxing Day. Uh, we would do a t a long show. Now Chris did. What do you remember? How long it was? Was it ten hours? Twelve hours? Nineteen hours? No, I think they were actually twenty four, weren't they? Did oh man, he's you know he was younger than me. I could only do. Uh, I think I did, I did twelve hours, Taylor. Yeah, he might have done 24, but remember, he kind of had a nervous breakdown towards the end there. Yeah, his hair went blue, <laughs> then he went bald, and then he was gone. <laughs> he started giggling uncontrollably. <laughs> it's a lot of work. That was a lot of fun. I, you know, I, when we first started doing the show in uh, Toronto, I did propose that, and everybody said, uh, no. <laughs> Nobody wanted to do it. But, you know, this is a pretty game crew we've got out here in Vancouver. Maybe we could do a 24-hour show uh, for you. Up for it? They all going, yeah! <laughs> so maybe we will do a, 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 we wouldn't call it a call for help-a-thon. We'd have to call it something like a labathon. The idea was, you know, you just got all your, your tech gear for the holidays. Now you can call us and we'll help you get it working. It was really fun, I have to say. I've, you know, we had a barbecue. We had lots of guests. Um, <laughs> I wore a bathrobe. It was great. <laughs> Taylor, it's great to talk to you. All right, thank you. Thanks for the call. I really, really appreciate it. Now, no let's take a look at a UL's Jewel, a free file that everybody's going to want to use. You see, he just, uh, you just missed it, but he just bent over to press the KVM He's switch. taking away the fourth well, we, wall. No, but that's what Taylor wanted to know, okay. is how, you know, and that's exactly how, how you do it. So, you know, in a way, we're a little bit different. The, what we're switching to is the TV output. Yeah. So uh, we may have many computers out here on the set, but only one of them goes on your screen, and so that's why we push that button. But it's the same idea. It's a single monitor. In this case, it's the television Yeah, monitor. you were seeing the Skype call on Brianna. 
Anna's computer, and then I switched over to you my switched computer. Over. So hers is connected to the same output yeah. as yours is, and so we just switched back. We and didn't forth. switch; they wouldn't be able to see what I'm talking They'd about. They see her computer. There you go. And what it is happens. she up to? Oh my gosh! Maybe you better look at your computer. <laughs> okay. What do you got? I got for Mac. It's called Butler. And it's, I love Butler. It's hard. It's basically just a bunch of little features that help speed up if you're doing the same things over and over. So when you install it at the top of your screen here, you'll see some icons right up top. So the first this is thing nice because you get a little Google search. You got bar. a Google search, and you have a little thing called bookmarks, and then you also have a, a link to your computer. So you can look through all your hard drives. Yeah. You can, uh, without opening your browser, go right to a page, exactly. and it will open so the browser. So what I'll do is I'll open it up here, and so for bookmarks, I, I can add my bookmarks. So I've added a document yeah. that whenever time I select it, it opens up I the document. I use this all the time. I love it. I can do websites. I can even do addresses. If there's like, I just want to do a quick email. I can it's comparable to Quicksilver, but it, it, it's just a different style and it might fit some people's style better than Quicksilver. The yeah. good thing is it's free. You can try both of them for free. Yeah. Peter Mora does this. It's a wonderful And it does program. some more mouse stuff. And then there's hot corners too. So right now I have a hot corner where I just go to my top left of the screen here and I can just start going through the directory of my computer. Isn't that neat? Just, it's really cool. So it's got a bunch of different features. It's really customizable. I love Butler. I use it. Actually, I'm using it now on my uh, laptop instead of Quicksilver. You know I'm a Quicksilver fanatic, but I Butler's great too. Uh, Quicksilver's are more keyboard too. This is a mouse. Yeah. And well, this keyboard. does a keyboard as well. It yeah. does. Yeah. Thank you. That's a Yule's Jewel. Where yeah. would you find that? Labwithleo.com. Free okay. files. Yule's Jewels. Right. That you find it on the screen, right somewhere there. Somewhere in there. <laughs> All right. We're gonna take a break. Brianna's coming up with her wee wee, her little wee wee. But first, I didn't come out right. What does Linux? Apache do? Is it an email server, a web page server, a firewall, or is it for online game hosting? I'll tell you what, we'll come back and tell you when the lab continues. Welcome back to the lab. Before the break, we asked you which of these uh, things does an Apache server do? It is, in fact, a web server, the most used web server on the internet. And it runs on Linux, actually, it runs on BSD, it runs on a lot of different. I think you can even run Apache on. Windows, but it does come with all Linux distributions. I know you can run an OS 10 because it comes with OS 10. So Apache is a very popular product. Look who's here, Buiana. Buiana. <laughs> you gave me that idea. You said you can call me anything, said, just don't call me Buiana. Yeah, and then now I ruined it because that's all you're calling me. <laughs> Brianna McIver is, uh, besides being a girl genius, it says so right here, and our uh, our esteemed co-host, she also is a Wii fanatic, and uh, has figured out a way to get. Video, audio, photos from my computer onto my Wii. It's a Wii exactly. Media Center. Yeah, um, one catch is it has to be a PC, so it's not going to work on the Mac. Okay. Just because the program that we're using is something called Orb. Orb is amazing. Yeah, so um, that's the one that I'm going to show you today. So the website is orb.com. Mm -hmm. You have to go there and you have to register first. Okay. Um, once you register, free registered, account though, right? Free account. Everything okay. is free. Yeah. Even the software is free. Yeah. Wow. So that's neat. Uh, once you register for the site, mm -hmm. you can then download. Okay. Um, it is for XP and Vista. Vista. Okay. I tried I tried downloading it on this computer on Vista and I was having some trouble so I just put it on XP but it is uh it's for both. Yeah. It's okay, for great. Both. Um, once you download it to your computer, the orb icon is going to show up in your system tray. And now we're running um, it. Look yeah. at this. So it will this will look at all the different kinds of media it supports. Yeah, so basically you never have to leave your couch. <laughs> <laughs> all your uh, stuff that you have in your computer, all your pictures, all your videos, you'll be able to see through your television using your Wii. So it uses the Wi-Fi in my network exactly, to yep. connect to the Wii. And it's not actually saving anything to your Wii, it's streaming. Yeah, because the Wii doesn't have a hard drive, yeah. so it has to all go yep. by stream. Okay. Yeah, so it's so streaming. How does it work? Should we uh, Well once you've downloaded it to your computer and it pops up in your system tray, you have to configure network. it. Okay. So you want to browse your files and make sure that it's pulling all the files that you want to see, see on your that. Wii from it's, the right location. It's seeing my videos. It's exactly. seeing my audio. Yep. So once you've logged photos. into mycast.orb.com on your computer, mm -hmm. you then have to go to your Wii and go to mycast.orb.com so that it can now, how link does, the two. Now, how does that show up on the Wii? Did you well, have to install I've, it? Or? Well, since this remote is a little bit hard for me yeah. to use, I've saved it as a favorite in our internet browser. So it's just a browser. You're browsing yep. to your website. Yeah, so okay. when, once you go to your Wii, you go to the internet channel. Got it. And you go to mycast.orb.com. And you'll have your login, and you'll log into Orb. Exactly. So basically, Orb's acting as a website interface to your video. That's your exactly audio. what it's doing. Oh, so really I've saved it as a favorite just so I don't have to type yeah, yeah. it in every time. And you probably will want to do that. Right. Yeah. Um, once you get into here, see it says we're logged in yeah. up here. You want to go to your settings, and since it's streaming all the video, uh -huh. you want to make sure that it's um, streaming in Flash, just because that's the fastest 
is, and that's what works best. So you, with so, all of these media formats, you find Flash is really the best way yeah, to go. Yeah, that's okay. what I found is the best. Okay. So um, just make sure that your settings are set to that properly. Mm -hmm. um, and now we can choose audio, video, photos. I mean, well, hey, I've got a video on here. I've got uh, the opening of the show. In fact, yeah. I'll just show you that this is a local video. I could play it here and using the... Uh, uh, using the, um, oh golly, let me not go through all of that. But anyways, if you have I to can check see it. and make sure that if it's playing on your computer, then it's going to play on your Wii. So, so it does have to work on your computer. Now it's, yeah. so let's see. So that is the lab opening, and now we should be able to see it. If I can use the Wii remote. Well, there's so much light in here. A lot of times these uh, remotes don't work so well. There, there we, we go. go. Da, da, da. Whoa, whoa, oh. ah, yeah. Got it. I clicked it. I'm going to play Wii Bowling with you. <laughs> That's what no, I'm gonna do. I'm good. I All promise. Right. So now you have. <laughs> yeah, she says she's good. So you want to go to browse folders because okay. that's where everything. So you're actually saved. browsing now your PC. Yeah. Wow, that's really amazing. How do you find the video? There it is. Yep, there it is. So how do you find the video? Uh, is does it, does it work pretty well? I mean, is the. Well, that's the thing. Um, the quality is less because it's streaming. It has to compress it to right. play it on your Wii. So it really so will depend also on how fast quality. You're... So if something is really good quality on your computer, it's not going to be as good right. on your right. Wii. But the good thing about this Here is that... Here we go. That, We're going to see some video. Yeah, is that it doesn't matter what type of video. It's going to encode it and oh, play it on the Wii. So it oh, doesn't okay. matter what type of format it is. Okay, so now um, it wants me to do something here. I'm not sure what. Oh, you don't have to do that. We're going to play it over here. It just takes a while because, like I said, it's streaming. Oh, it's streaming. Okay, there yeah, it is. Yeah, so it, it's a bit slow. Well, would you, would, you, would you watch your movies on here? You probably wouldn't. You might do well, a I mean, slideshow, listen to your music. Exactly. So your music and your photos, if you have family over in the right. living room, you don't you want to bring show. everyone around the computer, you yeah. put it right on your TV. So as you can see, it's playing the opening of the show from one of our other shows. That's cool. Right from the computer. That's pretty cool. Can I get rid of this, all of this? Does that um, go away there after is a way to change it in the settings. So you can, go so to you full can screen. hide it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I thought it was neat. So. And would you, all right, give us your review. Would you use this? I mean, it is free. There's a I would definitely use this for the purpose that I mentioned, all right. your videos yeah, that you yeah. have on your computer. And if you have people over, you don't want to crowd around Fun. the computer, depending on yeah. the size of your computer screen yeah. as well. Yeah. You want to transfer it all to your TV. And, and Orb is not just for Wii. Anything that you can use a browser with, it will work. So if you use your iPhone, you could look at your Orb stuff. You could look yeah. at uh, on a on a cell phone. You could look at on a variety of different devices. Mm -hmm. As long as you can browse to uh, mycast.orb.com, you probably can use it. Exactly. And one thing I want to mention as well is that I got this tip from lifehacker.com. So yeah, they have like step-by-step step tips on how to do it. And we so. thank Gina Trapani at Lifehacker for coming up with the idea. This is mycast, actually just orb.com, and then you'll be going to mycast.orb.com. Yeah. Thank you, Brianna. You are Very welcome. cool. All right, Brianna. now let's get the bowling up because I don't believe you. I want to. All right, we're, we're going to take a break and come back with a final word for you right after this. You stay right here. Oh. We're going to bowl. You, you you, and me, we're going to bowl. But before we I'm do, I see you have something on your uh, screen. I don't know what that is. What is that Wii oh, Minder? Oh, this Wii Minder over Yeah, here? what is that? Um, this is basically a website that you can save as a favorite in your Opera browser on your Wii. And what it does is it gives you tabbed browsing. So, like, in the in the browsers that you have really? on your computer. Yeah, so you just uh, add oh, that's the name really of the neat. website. And, um, yeah. So it's kind of like a, a Wii uh, add-on. See, I see the tab up there at the top. Yeah, it's so you cool. can just go down to this if the remote actually Thank you, works. Wii Anna. We're going to yeah. call you Wii Anna because she's the Wii queen and a genius. And a bowling champion. Uh, well, we'll see about out. that in just a little bit. Thank you for being here. While we go off and bowl, we invite you to come back. We'll be back here tomorrow. And, of course, if you want to be in the show, go to our website, labwithleo.com. Thank you, Brianna. Call, me. call Brianna. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. All right, get that bowling going. I'm ready. Oh,